Yes, so welcome to today's webinar. My name is Vincent Mohoro from Moi University uh, in Kenya, um, the campus director at Moi University uh, for the Millennium Fellows. And I'm really glad to moderate this event today. And today we'll have, we have our precious guest, uh, Pia, who will, uh, I'd like to probably say a few things about Pia before we begin. Uh, Pia believes in collective imagination. She, uh, she believes that we have the power to redesign philanthropy to serve well, uh, Pia. It's also important to mention that she's a Philippine born and uh, grew up in California. And she's, an oldest, she's the oldest daughter in an, in an immigrant family. So probably she'll be sharing on us on how to the experience uh, has been. And also she has uh, been able to, she navigates the robot and connections and brings in a force. She, uh, she, was also, she has also been a high school teacher and uh, she has, she's recognized internationally for being an advocate for trust-based philanthropy, as well as she's a radically embodied, she believes in radical embodied leadership. She chairs the trust-based philanthropy project, sharing committee and senses and serves as the board of the mediajustice.org. Pia is a visiting faculty at the University of Mons School of Environment, and uh, she also she she she's quite uh, she's quite the person when you talk about philanthropy and a person who does great things in the society. And so, without uh, much further ado, I'd like her to give her this chance that she can introduce herself and tell us more about her before she begins to speak. In case you've just joined us kindly, uh, we'd like to welcome you again. Indicate your name, the university they're from, the country and uh, feel free and welcome to engage in us on the chat. Welcome. Pia, welcome to the forum. Um, kindly introduce yourself and tell us something about, about the work that you do. Sure. Welcome. Thank you, Vincent, for introducing me and for being here when it's 8 p.m. and maybe sleepy time. So hi, everyone. This is Pia coming at you from Oakland, California. And I don't know about you, but I could use a smile today um, and some light and some breath because what a world you are inheriting. Thank you for being born. Thank you for being willing, <laughs> agreeing to lead us in these times where clearly every previous generation has just completely effed up. So first of all, thank you. Congratulations on your Millennium Fellowship. I wish I was your age and in college and at the beginning and in a fellowship like this, a global fellowship of just incredible proportions driven by so much vision and so much heart. So just, I have so much gratitude to start with and, and gratitude, I was, I was up last night thinking about you and thinking about what I could possibly say to you. you know, what could I possibly say to you as literally every structure and system that we can imagine from climate to government, to economies, um, to education are either uh, in complete disarray and dysfunction um, or even if they're sort of wobbling along, they're not meeting the needs of most of the world. You know, what can I say to you in a time where inequality is brutal and violent? You know, what can I say to you when our families, our rivers, our forests, you know, our, our wildlife is suffering at the level that it is suffering? I mean, I'm speaking to you just 40 miles from a raging wildfire that has taken over South Lake Tahoe, which is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. But of course, all of us are near, you know, we're not that far from one of the most beautiful places on the planet. And it's, it feels like everything is in peril, you know? So what I love about this fellowship and what I love about this prompt is that we're not here to bemoan the tragic, terrible leadership of the past that has gotten us here, right? We're here to be creative and generative and hopeful and joyful and playful, all of which describes my two and a half year old daughter. So I'm very grateful to have her in my life to be my teacher. And it's always funny to me, Vincent, that 
I should be a teacher to a group like you, because I actually feel that um, if I just muted myself and had you each share one piece of wisdom, you know, for, yeah. for now, that I would learn way more than you could possibly learn from me. And the only reason that my bio is so long, you all, is because I'm old, okay? I'm very old. So when you are as old as me, your CV and your resume is going to be very long, right? So it's, it's, it's like, I wish that my introduction was just like, this is Pia. Um, she is, uh, you know, just freshly leading. But I guess I've learned <laughs> something. I've learned a few things in life and um, I'm happy to share a little bit of it with you. And then Vincent, can you tell me how you want to do this? Do you want to ask me one question and then I answer that? Or do you want me to make a small presentation or how, how would you like the format to be? Oh, uh, well, um, we'd like to ask a few questions which we'll uh, probably respond to so that uh, also I can give an opportunity to the people to probably uh, find the places that they may want some more clarification upon. Is that okay? That is beautiful. Do you okay, want to ask thank you. another question? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, Firstly, you really don't look old as you claim to be. So, um, but the first question that I'd like to ask is, at what point did you know that you wanted to, 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 to be in the career uh, in social impact and uh, make a change to society? Yeah. I don't know if I had very much of a choice, Vincent. I mean, my parents immigrated to California from the Philippines when I was three years old. And yeah. And at the time that they immigrated to the United States, it was a relatively immigrant friendly time. And I think ever since then, it has become a much less immigrant friendly place. So, you know, just my personal experiences in my family and what it meant to, I think, have the choices of assimilation in the United States. If you're an immigrant, you can choose to assimilate and sort of try to achieve the American dream and that might work to a certain extent or not, right? Um, yeah. Or you can, um, you know, stay, and a lot, of, a lot of immigrants stay very connected to their home, you know? So my parents, were, like, we lived in a bubble that was only Filipino people, you know? But I think my first oh. couple, of, yeah. yeah, it was just like, that was my whole world was all Filipino people. But when I went to college, I went to UC Berkeley here, in the Bay Area. And I think it was a really grand awakening of understanding that my own personal experiences of feeling really out of place and unwelcome in Orange County, in California, in Southern California, were, were not just specific to me, that they were systemic, right? That there was a, there was a, but there was a bigger structure other than people's individual personal opinions that would have them treat me and my parents and my family like we were worthless. You know, I remember, you know, schoolmates telling me that the neighborhood I lived in was trash, that it, it was not a nice neighborhood, that it was very ugly that I, I, remember, I remember other students telling me that my, my house smelled bad or that my family had, didn't have you know, handsome or beautiful faces because our, our, our shapes, the, the shapes of our face were not right. I mean, I used to think that was because maybe we were not attractive or we were not you know, uh, strong. But when I went to UC Berkeley, I understood that this was called, you would call this racism. <laughs> And it's, a, and it's a structural, institutional, and cultural system that is born of and inherited from, you know, the, the history of the United States, which is based on extraction uh, and theft of land and slavery. So, you know, when I understood that these attitudes that people had towards me were not individual opinions as much as they were part of a larger system, then I, you know, I couldn't turn away from the notion that my purpose in life was to change the system. You know, so I think about loving the people and even the worst of the people, I really try my best to love the people and change the system. And that is, you know, that's a little bit of why 
I was inspired to go in the direction that I that I went. That's an amazing story to hear how you're able to transform the negativity and channel it into love and uh, and a passion for social change. So, um, we're looking back to your the years in that you're in undergrad and your experience serving as a visiting faculty. Um, Oh, and being able to interact with the young leaders, I presume that at some point you're also a leader when you are in your younger days. So what has been the experience? What has been the journey been, what has the journey been like? And what are some of the lessons that you have got you that you've gained along the way that you'd like to share with us? Yeah. With the young leaders here, yeah. Thank you, Vincent. I hope that you all embrace this truth that you are leaders regardless of how many awards you've gotten or what you've done, as long as you have a North Star, two things, you know who you're accountable to, who are you accountable to, right? And then what is your purpose? So even if no one's following you, (laughs) if you have a clear sense of who you're accountable to and what is your purpose, and when I say purpose, I mean a humanitarian, you know, social justice purpose, right? I mean, the purpose of just like, I want to be a millionaire, you know, it's a purpose and a lot of people have it. And actually, if that's one's purpose, fine. But when we're in the social impact space, when I talk about purpose, I mean, like, what is, what is, what is the problem you're solving for is another way that I've heard it put, you know, what are you solving for? And, and who are you accountable to? I think that question has to, you know, when, and when I try to answer that question, I think of my grandmothers, actually, both of them, you know, uh, one of them was, was, grew up very poor in the city and one of them grew up p- very poor on a farm. And when I think about being accountable to them and all the generations of women that preceded me, that really gives me a sense yeah. of purpose because the level of sexism and and the way patriarchy works, I don't know if any of you have been just horrified by Texas in the last 24 hours, but overnight, the governor of Texas and its Supreme Court basically banned abortion. And however we might personally feel about that issue, and this is where I wanna continue to make a distinction between personal preferences and systems and systemic change. However, we may personally feel about that choice, it is actually the choice of that person. And so for the system to say that that is not allowed, that to me is horrific. So for feminism and like a sense, you know, my grandmothers have connected me to a sense of feminism. Um, I feel really accountable to, to them and to all the women in the world who I believe have a hundred percent, a thousand percent right to make every choice that in the sphere of choices that one can make, regardless of location or culture or age, you know, or religion. And so that is why what happened in Texas really hurts my heart and why I always feel a renewed sense of purpose. And I'll just say one more thing, Vincent. Yes, yes, sure. Yeah, I never thought of, I've never, I've always had a hard time applying the word leader to myself, right? Because so yeah. many, so many concepts and pictures of leaders, if you look at the presidents of every single country on this phone call, on this, on this Zoom line, they're pretty much yeah. men, right? And so even just embracing that, th- that we can redefine leadership to be collaborative, all the things that are in the Millennium Fellowship, collaborative, empathic, um, compassionate, feminist, you know, um, yeah. I feel like. I've had to really claim that word for myself because I've always had such a difficult time applying it to myself. And I've always thought, you know, maybe I'm going to be discovered as a fake, you know, they're going to think you're going to, you're going to meet Pia and she's have been called this leader. And all of a sudden you just realize this is just a lady, (laughs) you know? Um, And so I, I, I just want to say if, if any of you have any sense of insecurity or feeling like it's fraudulent to call myself a leader. Um, This many decades later into my career, I will say that that still happens to me, you know? So just just knowing that the journey 
in the journey, there's never a point where, at least in my experience, where it's just really comfortable to say I'm in charge, you know? But what I can say is that I have purpose. I know who I'm accountable to. And I do have a vision, you know, a vision for, I think a vision that we share for a world in which every body and soul is liberated and free, you know, Um, and and well-resourced. That's my vision. Every body and soul is liberated, free, and well-resourced. Well, it's really refreshing to hear your point of view. And uh, actually, it's sort of comforting to know that the imposter syndrome is sort of <laughs> sort of affects everyone who has a, a, big, a big dream. So at uh, the moment, uh, the Millennium Fellows and probably the people that they'll be reaching or the young people in the world, they have these projects that they are undertaking. And at some point, they will need to get funding for these philanthropic projects and um, to undertake this work. So uh, we might you be able, we may would appreciate you will share about what goes through uh, the, the, the funder's mind when you apply and how, how do, how, how is there prescribed way about going, about going uh, on these matters so that you can be able to get the appropriate funding and um, is there, are there, ways that you can advise us, that you can connect to these funders and the donors so that you may be able to connect to them, not only um, not only to seem like you're just begging and begging every time, how do you present our ideas and how do we ensure that you get the funding and be able to project our projects forward? Um, Vincent, that is, that is the question that I have been working with for the past seven years, you know? So, So let me, so there's, there's a few ways that I think about this, you know, at the end of your comments, you said, how is it so that we're not begging, begging and begging all the time? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And this, and this is the problem, right? This is the problem with resources and their unequal and uh, unjust distribution, right? That, that you brilliant minds of the 22nd century whatever century we're in, you're the brilliant minds of that. And that you would be in the position to be visionary, brilliant young leaders having to then beg for resources. You know, that is inherently the problem with philanthropy. So before I try to give you any techniques or make connections, I'll just, I'll just say that is a structural problem. And that is what I mean when I say we need a well-resourced, liberated world, right? It's that, that, the way that it's set up is that, you know, all of the resources are being held by about, you know, 3%. (laughs) And it's, it's, um, and that's why we're in these positions. So a lot of my, the past seven years of my career has been to overturn those dynamics, to try to move philanthropy as a whole towards redistribution and reparation. And I will say I have achieved a tiny amount of success relative to the massive amount of wealth. You know, I think that there are funders and donors who have embraced some of the frameworks and philosophies that I have offered that we, not just me, but my, you know, my, my cohort, my, my network has offered called trust-based philanthropy, which is about reversing or redistributing power between, you know, the wealthy and those who have to then ask, you know, beg and beg and beg. Um, And yet we're still in that system, right? We haven't transformed that system yet. So you are in the position to, I hope, be both practitioners of transformation to help us transform that system with new forms and economic models and ideas about the redistribution of wealth, right? I hope that's coming from you. And, yeah. and and the same time you have to participate in the existing system. I think that's the that's the two feet that you have. You're straddling the old and the new, and that's why it, you're just such an exciting group to me, because I think that your that positionality where you have to you have to interface with these old systems, this patriarchy, this this the way philanthropy set up, and then innovate and imagine and, and create the new. 
So, so speaking to specifically working in the system of um, begging and begging and begging, um, I guess I have a few thoughts about that. One, just don't do it alone. Uh, I think that you, in your nature, you're probably more collaborative than some previous generations. So do nothing alone um, and really trust your squad, you know, really have a diverse uh, set of people that, you're, that are your squad that are bringing different perspectives and talents in different ways. You know, even that in and of itself is a transformation from the old model of, you know, a single, you know, usually white executive director, right, at the helm. So just even have your leadership models be what you really are, what you really are, which is probably more collaborative in nature. Um, so I'd say that, don't do it alone. I'd say there is no amount of money that is worth your soul, your spirit, <laughs> your body. Like there's just isn't, you know? Um, so, you know, like deeply believe in your purpose and what you're trying to achieve and be willing to receive feedback. But when you think about who to receive feedback from, it's not everybody. Like I'd say, know who you're trying to build with that's your squad. And then have a very tight uh, circle that's your advisors. I have no more than five. Five people on the planet whose opinions matter to me. That sounds crazy, but it's true. If we have more than five people whose opinions matter to us, it will be very difficult to stay sane and stay focused because then we're just trying to please too many people, you know? So have your squad, have a small set of advisors whose opinions really matter. Um, and the begging piece, um, that one is so tough because it does feel like that. I mean, I, I, we can't get around the sense that no matter what you call it, trust-based philanthropy, equitable philanthropy, participatory grant making, there's always this sense that, you know, you're trying to get them to just open the bank account and, and resource the work, you know? Sure. I, know that, I know that there's tons of alternative models around resourcing. I know there's grassroots fundraising. Um, I know there's like hybrid business nonprofit models um, I, and different revenue streams. I get all that. But when we want, you know, deep investment of capital, you know, I don't know, Sam, because you're the only other person I know on this line that has done a ton of fundraising. I, and so please jump in here, but I, I think it's, it, it actually comes down to the, the willingness and ability to develop deep relationship without attachment. So, right. I don't know, Sam, do you want to comment on that? I'm actually not a fundraiser. Well, but I, I think, um, yeah, I think the key is around it's definitely around relationship building. Um, but yeah, one of the things Kia that I've learned because there's been a lot of rejection along the way is, is, and it's hard for me sometimes, especially as a founder, but to, to try not to take that personally, to recognize that there are so many things happening in other people's lives that they may connect with you for a moment or, or more, but if they say no, um, oftentimes it's because they may have other priorities, other things that are uh, important and central in their lives, and that's okay. Um, and so it's just trying to, as people have advised me, it's trying to find people who do feel aligned, um, aligned in values. And, and really, I think um, they're trying to go in some similar direction to where you're trying to go. Um, and that's, that's definitely guided me, but, uh, I'm still learning to you. <laughs> I know, I know. And I know it's, I, I'm so glad you brought up rejection because there's two sides of that. Right. So I have, I, you know, I have a limited amount of money that I give away every year and it's actually getting smaller and smaller because we're spending out the endowment. And so there's so many people that I have to say no to, or I have to say, I can't give as much as I'd like. 
And what I really want you to take in is that do not take, do not make other people's limitations some kind of assessment of you, you know? My portfolio is limited or my priorities have to go in this direction. It is not necessarily um, like a, a top, bot, top to bottom rejection of you and your ideas, you know? And I think it's hard because no means no, right? Or <laughs> not right now means not right now. And it's very difficult not to make that feel like, oh, it's about me. But remember my story where I realized that all the people who thought my family was weird, <laughs> they weren't right, right? They were just part of a system, you know? So yeah. I'm, st I'm still implicated in this system that has to say no more than I can say yes until, you know, someone gives me a lot more money to give away. So, um, so thank you for those points, Sam. I, I know it's a rough road and I really appreciate you sharing that. Thank you so much, Pia and Sam, for the wonderful insights. I mean, we are learning a lot. We anticipated to learn a lot, but then I think you're exceeding what your uh, expectations. So I have two last, I have two questions. And uh, before I ask them, I'd like to encourage the Millennium Fellows to kindly, if you have a question, uh, put it down in the chat chat box and uh, we'll be able to to ask them to pair. So um, I'd like to ask about your, your, your journey as uh, in the media, mediajustice.org, as we have, uh, currently in the media, we have that thing. The media is trying to be controlled by so many by so many people, by so many other factors. It's becoming too monetized. And uh, how how has been the journey? Um, being uh, one of the chair, one uh, one of the core people in that organization, and also like as you probably as you wind up on the question on this Q and A session, if you could probably give us some advice as the Millennium Fellows on how we can continue growing and uh, you know the part. The, the essential tips that you find that will be necessary, even as we continue to continue our um, local projects and also transforming them to the projects that will make global impact. Yes, thank you, I think, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Vincent, such, such beautiful questions. Um, so my journey around media justice started when I was probably around your age. I was around 20, 20 I think, or 21, when I got a job with this little, radical group called we interrupt this message we interrupt this message and it was a a group that was trying to interrupt the terrible stereotypes that that the media was putting out um especially about um you know young black and brown people in the united states so i did uh, a journalistic study of the new york times with a set of of, of high school students actually and we, and we actually proved that they were over-reporting youth crime, uh, meaning that they were, they were making stories of youth crime much more uh, popular than the percentage of youth crime that was actually happening. So just, so just grabbing that, it's like, there's a statistical reality, you know, 3% of crime is youth crime. But then if the cover of every, you know, local, you know, uh, page is, covering a crime of a youth and usually picturing a young black or brown person in like an orange outfit, right? What the media is doing is not reporting youth crime. It is creating and perpetuating um, and justifying a notion that black and brown, especially young men are dangerous, right? So we, yeah. we did study to, to prove that. And then we actually met with the New York Times and they were not happy. Um, but we we demanded that they that they uh, de decrease their coverage of youth crime to match the statistical reality, which they actually did. So that was my beginning of my interest in the area of media and the power of media to shape our consciousness. So fast forward to now, I'm on the board of MediaJustice.org, and it has very similar goals, which is to to call out the ways that media, media conglomerates, um, ha, you know, have the power to shape our consciousness. Actually, we do a lot of work also in, you know, um, in a lot of areas, a lot of racial justice work now. And so I'll say that what we care about is not just that the images 
uh, don't continue to perpetuate stereotypes, but we actually care that people have broadband access. We care about internet being a free resource like air. Um, we care about regulations, federal regulations that favor con like media conglomerates like Verizon over you know, poor households. So we do a lot of policy work, a lot of edu sort of educational campaigns. Um, and I'm pretty far away from that organizing work because I sit on the board and my role on the board is to really help the executive leadership figure out how to navigate funding, strategy, um, and transition. So that's mainly what I'm doing on the Media Justice Board. Um, but it comes from my roots in uh, really understanding that we have to, that, that the media itself is not a blanket static thing that we can continue to to push on it and advocate for um you know uh justice in in terms of representation but also ownership and voice in terms of whose voice gets to be heard whose stories get to be heard so we also work a lot on you know because i don't know if you all know this but in the united states ethnic local ethnic media has basically died so um it's really unfortunate because local ethnic media were a lot of the ways that people got much more grassroots storytelling and much fairer understandings of what was going on in local communities. <clears throat> but they were small businesses that had very difficult time continuing. So now the news that you get out of the United States comes from these huge corporations or they come from sort of private parties that are just buying the airwaves, often very right wing. So, um, so the other thing that we pr promote, and I don't know if any of you, some of you might be working on this, is just kind of the power of local journalism and local journalists and making sure that that kind of grassroots media doesn't disappear in the, in the technological age. Oh, wonderful. Oh, thank you, Pia, for, for answering our questions and for really taking your time to address these issues comprehensively. So we have a question from Kamsim Walker from Nigeria. And uh, he asks about um, how are you able to manage between your personal life, being able to feed yourself, feed yourself and your family. You mentioned that you have a beautiful daughter, if I may mention that. And um, so how, how, how does the balance where you are able to balance your philanthropy work? Did you have some side business on the side where you're, you're getting income or how, how, how are you able to go about it? Because also we as young people, you also need to understand this, but you can understand whether philanthropy will be a full-time job or whether we also have to other, other careers. Also, I can see that Murali Krishna is also asking whether philanthropy and business, whether you can put them as one thing or you need to have a clear cut difference. With, yeah, you have choose. to choose between philanthropy and career. Yeah. So let me start by saying there are ways to understand what it means to be a philanthropist. One way is that you have individual wealth or family wealth and you're giving it away. That is not me. <laughs> Um, another way is that you can work in, in organized philanthropy as a staff person. So that is me. So I work for a foundation. The endowment was given to us by a wealthy donor who died, right? So, um, but I will say that, that my career and my work, regardless of whether I'm a high school teacher, you know, an organizational development consultant or a funder, I feel like my career path is, is, is singular. Like, again, my vision is for the liberation, right? The liberation and full resources, full resourcing of every person, soul, body on the planet, right? Animals too. Um, so no matter what I'm doing to earn money, somebody not muted. I'm sorry, there's like a lot of sound. Um, no matter what my job is, I feel like my North Star is my purpose, right? And um, the choices I've had to make, I mean, in terms of balancing my life goals, my personal goals and my career goals, um, I think with the job that, I'm, honestly, with the job that I currently have, because it's a small foundation, because we're a co-executive directorship, and because it's a very quirky foundation and doesn't, it doesn't require my you know, 80 hours a week for me. I, I probably took a lower salary than I could have gotten if I had taken a job at Ford or um, some big foundation. But what I chose was flexibility. I wanted to have a baby. 
Um, I wanted to do something other than like sit at my desk and work. <laughs> so I chose a job that paid less probably than there are jobs that you can get that sort of require you to be on call for the job pretty much 24 seven. I remember someone interviewed, someone recruited me to try to run Sam, this is funny, the Boston Foundation. And in the, in the initial like preliminary conversation, they said, so are you willing to do five or six nights a week of events and work on weekends? And I said, I have a toddler. Like, there's just no way I'm going to give up, you know, time with my toddler to go to some like, you know, city hall dinner thing. So, so I knew I wasn't a fit for that job and they knew that too. Right. But so I chose flexibility over money sometimes. And then the other just short thing I'll say about organizing my time is I try to do the hardest thing first. You know how you wake up every day and you think, oh my God, I have to have that conversation or, oh my God, I have to send that proposal. Or, you know, you just have the one thing that you've just been putting off or you don't, I just try to do it first, <laughs> like 8 a.m., just do it. Kind of like how some people work out at 8 a.m. That is not me, but some people just try, you know, I just try on the work side, I try to do the most difficult thing first. And I try to leave the the easier things like answering emails or, you know, running invoices or something. I kind of leave them to like the afternoon when my brain is less on. So just ask yourself, when am I the most on, you know, and for some people, I know that's like 10 p.m. at night. <laughs> so, you know, asking ourselves when we have the most energy and juice and doing the most difficult things we have to do then is helpful. The other thing I would say is, you know, really call it like, what is the end of your day? What is the end of your work day? Because I know with, with our phones and our, and our watches, <laughs> like we're cyborgs. So we could be knowing that someone sent us an email at 11 p.m. and we think, oh my God, maybe I have to read that email. So what I really try to do is I say, this is the end of my workday today. It's going to, some days it's 5 p.m., some days it's 7, some days it's 9, but I have to call it and then really log off. It's very difficult to do because I also, you know, get some pleasure out of my phone, like Instagram. <laughs> so I, I, I have to, I have to be disciplined because otherwise I am responding to emails at 2 a.m. Uh, when I get up to get a drink of water and it's not a great idea. Like we have to, we have to, you know what I wrote in my journal this morning? I said, the most important thing to do every single day is find some way to have deep rest. Deep rest is the most important thing to do every day, right? It's the antith antithesis to what people tell you how to succeed in business. But honestly, Mahatma Gandhi, when Mahatma Gandhi had a difficult day ahead, instead of meditating for one hour, he would meditate for two hours starting at 4 a.m., right? So just like we can't go into our lives frazzled and burnt out every day and lacking sleep and rest and time away from the screen. So if there's anything you do in any 24 hour cycle, it's get deep rest. And then when you are rested, do the hardest thing first. There's probably more questions. Hale, Hale, sorry about that. Um, we have Hale, she has a, um, Hale with a question. Hale, can you unmute yourself and we'll let you hear your question. Hi, Pia. It's so, so good to hear from you. And I also know you from before, so I was very excited to come on this meeting. Um, yeah, so I also know that you have some experience in media justice. Um, and I know that a lot of um, probably fellows in this course, we use media as like a channel to create like impacts and educate the public. So I just want to ask you of some methods or advices that you might have for us to efficiently use this, this channel and platform to, you know, educate and maybe ultimately raising funds successfully for our causes. Yeah, beautiful question. Hi, Ha. It's nice to Hi. see you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm probably not the best person on the media justice team to respond to this great question. I mean, clearly so much creativity comes from you in how you use these platforms. Um, two things that I've just been having fun with lately are 
the idea of our asks not being so serious, like not being so serious all the time in our in our advocacy. So I'm working on basically like a comedy sketch, like to to do to try to transfer some of the messages I want to transfer to philanthropy in like a short comedic interview. <laughs> Like, like the kind you might find on YouTube or like Insta. So I guess one piece of advice is like, if it's grueling and hard for you, it might not be that fun to watch, you know? So like, what is, what brings you joy when you make it? Even if it seems really silly and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to get any resources for making this like, you know, ridiculous thing with like bunny rabbit ears, but you never know. I mean, look at all these YouTube millionaires. I mean, so, so I guess what I'm saying is like, have a good time because there's so much media and there's so many different things you can click on that, you know, your standard, your standard pitch or your standard ask is just, no, it's, it's hard to watch at this point. I watch videos of myself talking on webinars and I think, how did people not fall asleep? This is so boring, you know? Because there's like nothing going on other than my head talking, you know, so, so just have fun. And the second thing is, you know, globally, I know that there are so many platforms to do grassroots fundraising. So you have a local, where are you, where are you, ha? Are you in? Um, I'm currently doing my project in Vietnam, but I'm studying in the U.S. <laughs> Beautiful. So you're yeah. in Vietnam doing a project, right? But you can reach people everywhere who might care about you know, the purpose of your project or the people that you're supporting, right? So, you know, use those online grassroots fundraising platforms um, and use your networks to get them out there. And again, if you have a piece of media that you have a lot of fun creating, even if it's about a serious topic, right? It's like hard to make a fun, fun snippet about, you know, pro, like pro-choice, but it's probably possible. Talk to my friend, Kiara Johnson. She's uh she's in the U.S., but she's worked on pro-choice all her life, and I feel like she's made me laugh so many times while I'm like donating to her cause. So just you know, have fun, be light, be joyous, because how why else would we be anything else? And um and use the online grassroots fundraising platforms um in the most resourced parts of your network. So maybe the most resourced parts of your network aren't in Vietnam, you know. Um, but are just, you know, the United States can be a cash cow for those kinds of things um, if you get the right distribution channels. Thank you so much, Pia. <laughs> of course, huh? Um, Vincent, there's a question here that I feel really moved by. It's from Karina. It said, have you ever felt stuck in your project? questioning whether in the future the project will meet its proposed goals or not. Every day, Aparna, <laughs> every day, not stuck, but I wonder, are we really going to transform philanthropy? Are donors and funders really going to give up their power, redistribute the wealth, make reparations to Black folks like and Indigenous people? Is that really going to happen? So it's not that I feel stuck, it's that I I sometimes understand the magnitude of what we're up against, you know? And that's where I can't always look at the opposition or the problem. I have to find a wellspring of inspiration and rest and, and spiritual purpose. Because it, it is, a you know, most of us on this call, it's a David and Goliath situation, right? But guess what? At the end of that story, the, you know, the giant does fall. And so it has to be okay with us if we're not there. <laughs> like I've said to myself, if I'm not standing there when the giant falls, I want at least I want to be part of like pulling the sling back. You know what I mean? Maybe I'm pulling the sling back and the giant's going to fall in like three generations from now or one generation from now, but, but I want to be part of it, you know? So, so when you're feeling disillusioned, that's when you need your squad and your five advisors. That's that's the whole thing about the individualistic mentality of entrepreneurship and American entrepreneurship in particular is like when you hit that wall, you're not alone. And if you set yourself up right now so that you are alone, that's OK, because there will be people that you can reach out to to bring into your squad, bring into your advisor cabinet um, 
So that's, that's what I do. I mean, I have a best friend that I've had since I was your age. We went to Berkeley together and we used to teach together. Her name is Nat. She has three kids now um, with, and she has twins that are babies, but literally every time I hit a wall of any kind, she, we have a bat phone, you know, like on the, on the, on the emojis, there's like a little red phone. I just text her the little red phone. And then as soon as she can, she calls me back, you know? So you have to know who's at the other end of your red phone. You have to know that so that, cause you will hit a wall like every day or every week in this work. There's no way around that. The Goliaths are pretty big, but again, we're going to win. <laughs> we just don't know exactly how and exactly when, you know, but we have to, we have to feel the win as much as possible, even when we hit the wall. Okay, Vincent, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to not listen to Love that. Uh, it's actually interesting to listen to you. I, we hardly realize the time is passing. I'm actually surprised that we have been going for that long. It's uh, it's really amazing. So, um, so the, we have a question from Karan Krishmuri. I'm not sure whether Karan is here. Um, Karan, if you are here kindly and mute yourself and introduce yourself and ask the question. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, so, uh, good evening, uh, Ms. Infante. My name is Karan, and uh, I'm a university student at Amity University, India. And my question was, you know, uh, during your journey, you recalled, you know, dealing, interacting with various organizations, trusts, and parties, and you learned when to say no or not right now. So, during the initial, you know, few years of your work, how did this personally affect you, you know, learning when when to allocate the resources to whom and when not when to withhold for any reason and uh, how did you come to confront this killing yeah wow karan that is um that's a beautiful question it's i wrote a whole blog post once about how terrible i was at making grants <laughs> i felt anxious and sweaty anytime i was trying to make a decision and and Quran, the decisions were not always they were never individual personal decisions you know they had to do with the mission and strategy of my foundation and the values and the culture and how well they were matching you know the that organization plus whether or not i had funds in my portfolio at the time so they were like you know algebra it was like calculus to to do it um in a lot of ways that included relation, relationship. And it was really hard. I was so nervous. Uh, and I always felt like I, you know, was it was disappointing someone and I was making somebody else very happy. And it was, it was really, it was, it was hard to hold that power really. Um, but what I learned over time is that if the more transparent that I am, like the more, the more information I give when I say no, the better. Like at first it was like, I'm sorry, we just can't do that right now. And then it became, okay, let me tell you exactly what's going on behind the curtain, right? This is what's happening with my board. This is what's happening with the spend out. This is what's happening with my priorities. And the more I learned to give more information, the better it was, I think on both sides, you know? And I also really tried not to create expectations, like not to say, well, I have to say no now, but try me again in a year. Like I never would say that. I would, you know, a no was always just like, I'm so sorry. Let me be transparent. These are the reasons why. But not, you know, you want to make someone feel better in that rejection moment. So it's really easy to throw in there. Well, maybe there'll be some next year, but I never do that. I just, I never create expectations when I do not have a guarantee you know, and the way that I live with that, hold on, Ooh, whoop. your food is burning. Um, somebody's cooking, but not in the kitchen. Hold on. Um, okay. Well, it's okay. It's okay. We understand. <laughs> um, well, guys, I hope that you're still continuing to, intro to, to introduce yourself and uh, continue putting the questions that you have on the chat box, and we'll have be addressing them. Uh, if, um, I don't know whether she's back. Oh, here. here. Sorry, I was unable to unmute. Um, 
Okay, small kitchen fire, no worries. Um, but that, I mean, I love that question, Karen, because it's really, it's honestly one of the hardest parts of this world. And um, especially, you know, making those kinds of decisions that impact people's lives. But that is part of the reason that we have the platform for trust-based philanthropy, like really encouraging, um, you know, encouraging, inspiring, and pushing donors and donors to be much more honest and transparent. And, um, and hopefully that means that the experience you will have as, as seekers of resources, hopefully our work will have a positive impact on your experience. That is my, my hope. Um, but I think we may have run out of time. I'm not sure. Thank you so much, Priya, for joining us. We've learned a lot, and uh, we look forward to interacting with you and engaging you uh, in future. So we'd well, like to make a request if you could kindly indi uh, indicate in the chat box on how we can reach you, or we can reach your trust-based philanthropy and uh, be a part of the media justice.org and be able basically to interact with you and learn more from you, um, even beyond uh, this engagement. We would really love if you could uh, share the details in the chat box. You probably a LinkedIn, your Facebook, your Instagram, your Twitter, and your email. We'll really appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing the wonderful insights. And um, thank you, fellow fellows, for being a part of this journey. We have loved having you from every part of the world that you have in and uh, for dedicating this time to listen. Thank you so much. Kindly remember to join us this weekend. We'll have our SDG conversation. So, Phil, welcome. And um, Keep the fire burning. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Vincent. That was some beautiful moderation. Wow, y'all. I'm very impressed. As always, it's great to be here. Uh, find me on Twitter. It's Pia Vision. Insta is Pia Zool74. That's more like pictures of Costa Rica and my baby. And then um, and I put my email in the box. Please use it sparingly if possible. And then I'm also on LinkedIn. If you just go, if you just go to LinkedIn, Pia Infante at LinkedIn. Okay. Yay. Thank you so much. Good luck with everything. Thank you so much. So we can live at our own pleasure. Thank you so much for once again. Say hi to your daughter. <laughs> Bye.